Hi there, everyone. My name is Priyak Dathani. I'm actually a second year resident at Stanford in internal medicine. And today I want to talk about antibiotic choices for patients with aspiration pneumonia. This is a very nuanced topic, but I think it's also very important because as you progress more and more in your training, you'll realize that not all pneumonias are made equal. And more importantly, aspiration pneumonia is a very common disease. So um, I want to go ahead and give you the background for this, and I'll also share some of the citations. Um, aspiration pneumonia accounts for 5 to 15% of community-acquired pneumonia. Community-acquired pneumonia means that you did not get the pneumonia um, after being in the hospital or having recently been discharged from the hospital. And so if you recently got a pneumonia and you had not been close to a hospital recently, then we call that community-acquired because you got that from the community. Um, with that being said, the actual diagnosis of pneumonia is something we're not going to get too much into, but usually it presents with some sort of symptom, which means like a cough, or maybe you're short of breath, or maybe you're a little hypoxic. And then we usually get a chest x-ray. And the chest x-ray shows some infiltrates within the lungs at times, and that usually is often enough to diagnose someone with pneumonia. There's a lot of other small nuances we can get into, but I'm not going to uh, dive too much into them. But then with the pneumonia, to define it as aspiration pneumonia, that usually means that you aspirated. And this is a term that I used to get very confused when I started medical school. Aspiration basically means that, you remember when you take a deep breath, all of that air usually goes into your trachea, which is the lungs. And then when you swallow, let's say you swallow some of your saliva, that actually goes into your esophagus. Those are two different tubes, and those should usually not be interacting. And so when you aspirate, what that essentially means is something that's essentially supposed to go into the esophagus accidentally goes into the trachea, aka your windpipe. And when that goes into your windpipe, that means that you know, mucosa that is not usually used to having different types of material there is now exposed, and that is a very uh, high nidus for infection. Aspiration pneumonia is really common in older individuals because one, their swallowing reflex is often not as strong. Two, sometimes people who are older often have reasons to aspirate, such as maybe someone has a squamous cell carcinoma of the neck that impedes their ability to swallow appropriately. For example, people with Parkinson's can often have neuromuscular asynchrony that often makes them higher risk for aspirating. And when someone aspirates, again, that means that some of the oral bacteria can sometimes get into your lungs, which is the perfect nidus for infection. The Empir empiric antibiotic coverage for aspiration pneumonia has been debated over time because some people usually think that in your mouth you have a lot of anaerobic bacteria, which means bacteria that usually can survive without oxygen. So they usually thought that you needed some level of anaerobic coverage, but you'll see that that has actually changed over time. The discussion today I'm talking about is about aspiration pneumonia, but it does not refer to aspiration pneumonitis, which is just the inflammatory reaction often that happens to um, your lungs when you happen to aspirate. This actually is implying that you actually do get infected. So with that being said, as I said, early on, it was thought that anaerobic bacteria were the predominant pathogen in aspiration pneumonia. So you needed to have antibiotics that covered anaerobes to cover for aspiration pneumonia. So if I have a patient that came in that I think had aspiration pneumonia, I would usually start them on anaerobic coverage. There's only a handful of things that have anaerobic coverage, but the most low stakes antibiotics that have anaerobic coverage is usually a penicillin with a beta-lactamase inhibitor because a beta-lactamase inhibitor prevents um, prevents the bacteria from activating their beta-lactamase gene that can help get rid of their um, get rid of the penicillin. That has long been the standard of care, but there are now papers that are coming out that are showing that you actually don't need to have anaerobic coverage, and you can actually get away with purely just gram-negative coverage and aspiration pneumonia. And the reason why this is, is that in the past, they think that they may have been culturing patients a bit later on, and that by that point in time, they often may have had an empyema, they may have had a lung, lung abscess, and and when you have an empyema or a lung abscess, you actually do need anaerobic coverage. But if you don't have an empyema or an abscess and you just aspirated, you can probably get away with just purely community-acquired pneumonia coverage, which is usually uh, gram-negative coverage with something with like ceftriaxone and atypical coverage with something like azithromycin. So the paper I'm going to refer to today, I'm also going to link in the description below, but there was a retrospective study that was recently done that actually involved around 4,000 patients across 18 Canadian hospitals. And again, this is retrospective. So it means you're starting the study today and you're looking back in time and analyzing that data, moving all the way up to today, right? And to be eligible, physicians need to have made a diagnosis of aspiration pneumonia and have treated that patient with antibiotics. 
I'm going to go into now the methods just very briefly because I think it's important to know where a lot of these studies are coming from. But you'll see that in this retrospective study, they analyzed 2,683 patients who were essentially diagnosed with what they thought was aspiration pneumonia and were treated with limited anaerobic coverage. What that means is no anaerobic coverage, usually just with ceftriaxone and like maybe um, atypical coverage. And then you'll see that in 1,316 patients, they were treated with extended anaerobic coverage. And what that means is they usually did have some antibiotic that had anaerobic coverage. And you'll see that they then analyzed the ultimate results of this to see if there was any difference and if the patients who had aspiration pneumonia benefited from the extended anaerobic coverage or if the outcomes were about the same. And what you'll see is that both groups had about the same amount of mortality. And so you'll see that adding on anaerobic coverage did not actually change mortality and actually also did not change readmittance rates, right? See, these are all things that we care about and these are outcomes we care about. Let's say we treated people with aspiration pneumonia with anaerobic coverage and it decreased mortality. Well, then it makes a case that we should be treating with anaerobic coverage. But in this case, you're seeing that it didn't actually change outcomes. And so at this point, we should try to minimize antibiotics because you'll see that the risk of C. diff colitis was significantly higher in the individuals that were treated with extended anaerobic coverage. And this is the whole reason we want to be very steward-like with our antibiotic choices. By exposing individuals to antibiotics they may not need, what you're essentially doing is increasing the chance for resistance, and you're also increasing the chance that someone gets an infection like C. diff, which is often directly correlated with how much anti antibiotics you can have. So I'm going to end with just a bit about C. diff and why we care about it. C. diff is usually a oftentimes a hospital-acquired infection, and it usually ends up happening in your GI tract because usually a lot of these antibiotics are oral. So when you take these oral antibiotics, they destroy some of the bacteria in your GI tract, and that allows the C. diff bacterium to propagate. And you'll see that the way to minimize C. diff is to try to minimize the number of antibiotics and the duration of antibiotic treatment. You want to keep the antibiotics as specific as possible to the thing that you're treating, and you also want to treat it for the shortest amount of time possible while achieving the same outcomes. And you'll see that if you do two antibiotics instead of one antibiotic, you have an oftentimes a 2.5-fold increase in getting C. diff. If you have five antibiotics, you have a 9.6-fold increased risk of C. diff. Similarly, if you have antibiotics for more than 18 days, you have a 7.8-fold increase in getting C. diff to someone who had antibiotics for fewer than four days, right? So this is the whole point. You might think, hey, why don't we just go ahead and increase anaerobic coverage for someone who we think aspirated? Well, one, if it doesn't change outcomes, and two, it decreases the risk of C. diff. You have a higher thought process of as to why you want to go ahead and just treat these individuals as if you would normally treat community-acquired pneumonia, which is usually with some level of gram-negative coverage and sometimes atypical coverage, okay? So the TLDR of this video, try to minimize anaerobic coverage for aspiration pneumonia. Obviously, if you have an empyema or a lung abscess, it's very different. And the reason why we want to be very prudent about the way we pick antibiotics is because by increasing the antibiotics, we often subject our patients to are increasing the length of treatment, you increase the risk of C. diff, which is quite a toxic infection, and you want to try to minimize it. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please drop a like, comment, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one. Peace.